average campaign is seven thousand dollars for crowdfunding today and there's been a million successful campaigns to date which is very interesting it's a new thing here is how crowdfunding fits in crowdsourcing there are five divisions first one is cloud labor where you can actually hire people online the next one is knowledge Crowdfunding is the third one. Fourth is open innovation, where you do competitions potentially. Pharmaceuticals like doing innovation competitions to see how to solve problems. And then crowd creativity. So that's how crowdfunding fits into the crowdsourcing. And the four types of crowdfunding we're going to discuss today. The four types. Donations. Out of the five, well, to, according to me, six billion in crowdfunding in 2013, half of that will be from donations, where two or more people use the internet to make a payment towards a charity, also known as microfinancing and peer-to-peer -peer financing. This is not peer-to-peer -peer finance, microfinance. This step here and microfinancing, loan-based, which we also call debt crowdfunding. As I mentioned before, Lending Club hired John Mack, who is the former CEO of Morgan Stanley, to their board a year ago. And when the report on the $5.1 billion size of the market was done, the, report, the report company, reporting company did not know that Lending Club was exploding. They were doing a trajectory for 500 million in 2012 when the report was made, but they are actually breaking 2.1 billion this year, which will make the numbers over 6 billion for this year. And the runner-up for debt-based crowdfunding is not even one-eighth of the size. So Lending Club has closed, and what they do is they'll give you a up to 35,000 dollars as a personal peer-to-peer -peer loan on the website against consumer credit loans. So if you have a credit card or a payment on a, on a car, you can apply for these loans on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And interest is between 8 to 25 percent, depending on the rating you have. So a lot of people are putting money in here and actually pension funds have actually entered the industry and started putting money in. So it's actually a institutional product as of today, as 67% of the investments are coming in from institutions and pension funds, looking at this as a great way of getting a strong return on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, diversifying the risk. So this company has actually is actually changing uh, the numbers of crowdfunding more than Kickstarter or anybody else. For example, Indigo is another, um, the Rocket Hub is another. All those three are the leading three in the world today, all three based in the U.S. Here you give a donation and you receive something as a reward in exchange, such as a CD, an experience, a product, and bankers, when I talk to them in, in New York, and I tell them, this is just a pre-sell of a product that doesn't exist yet. They start laughing, saying, hey, we've done pre-sells for 20 years. Now we get it. That's what crowdfunding is. Okay. <laughs> it's just another way of calling something using technology to reduce the cost of communication and transaction. So, on any base. Anytime you deal with securities, you're dealing with that equivalent of the SEC of the US, the Security Exchange Commission. Each country has one um, monitoring and outlining how you may or may not discuss, sell, offer, and deal with securities. Now when equity is trying to take off worldwide, it certainly is getting 90% of the media attention because the technologists of crowdfunding are now fighting with the security lawyers and security issues of each country. 
and that's why it's getting so much attention. Last year, crowdfunding for equity, which is mainly operational in the UK, even though they don't have a specific law for it, stood for about 3% of the $2.7 billion market share, which is minute. So there hasn't been a proof that this thing can take off and explode. Italy had a crowdfunding law that has no limit passed three months ago, and I, well, actually last summer, and I broke the news on Forbes that Italy has a new law and the first law in the world allowing crowdfunding. Well, it's uh, five, six months later, and there has not been one single deal transacted underneath this new law in Italy. Of course, there are five, six that are planning to do that, and I'm actually in Italy right now. We're writing a book called Investors of Italy. We find a lot of opportunities in Italy being undervalued, such as real estate, um, agriculture. So uh, one of the leading lawyers and I are writing a book and advising CONSOB, which is the SEC equivalent, on how to release capital to startups and early stage companies. And as you said before, thank you, Ali, for telling me that we came with a book called Planet Entrepreneur a month ago on Amazon. And uh, investors in Italy will come out in four or five months. And we're also writing a third book about new capital formation that should come out in January. These things can be found on my website, thesoholoft.com. Um, equity is getting a lot of attention. But we haven't seen the scalability of equity for crowdfunding. And for me, it's important that we discuss what the definition is of crowdfunding. My definition, and I've been deconstructing what people are using and using in countries of the world, is where you have two people or more making a payment online towards one cost, project, or experience. And if we use that as a framework, then you know, it's important to understand that the ultimate crowdfunding is when it doesn't matter how accredited or rich somebody is giving the money, has this background. And that portion that I just is that equal positions in most countries in the world and it's just with. Kickstarter is the fourth largest reward company. They're almost as bigger than the second number up, and they have a great momentum. They're privately owned and have no debt, and are, you know, making a big difference on a global basis. For instance, we're not going to do campaign. You know, it's very easy. I just wanted to show that. You just go on there and you fill out your name and your password. That's it. You're logged in. Then you click on Facebook and you let everybody else know that you're on Kickstarter. You do the same thing when you do a campaign. You can do it tonight. You just type in what you want to do. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to uh, apply for anything. Of course, Kickstarter will review what you want to do as a, as a project and they retain the right to reject you. Uh, Indiegogo, the second runner up, they are more generous and they take just about anybody who submits a project that they want to raise money for. As you saw before, the average rate is 7,000. There's a lot of smaller ones and there's a lot bigger ones that we're going to touch on later on here. And you should actually go on Kickstarter, Indiegogo and just do some searches. Look at what people are doing. Look at the innovations coming out. Look at what people are paying. And also look at what people are offering as a reward. It doesn't have to cost money to do, offer a reward. You know, I am advising the Washington Ballet in Washington, uh, Washington of course, last year on crowdfunding campaigns. I'm also working with Bloomingdale's. And some of the suggestions I'm saying is, Put somebody's name above your door and let them pay you thousand dollars for it. Put a thank you on the website. You know, give acknowledgement and do an interview of somebody who gave you money. 
It doesn't have to be product that's going to cost you money. You can be clever about how you reward people. A lot of movies, which this started with, um, are saying, look, if you give us $10,000, we'll let you be in the movie. If you give us more money, we'll actually give you a role that's throughout the movie. There's ways to get people involved and give them rewards that actually will fund you faster. And we'll talk about some of these shortly. Indiegogo, second largest one in the world. I just wanted to show viewers their homepage so you get a feel for how it looks like. Me personally, I'm very visual. I want to see how things look like. And as I saw before, just put your name and contact info in to register. It's really, really easy. Rocket Hub is the third one. They're based in New York. Uh, there are about two, three former bankers in their 30s running it. Good group of guys. Very focused on universities. Gift Together is a company uh, that, that we've seen come up that we liked uh, because they had actually done a competition format for donations. So if somebody on Facebook told their friends about your campaign, this company was actually allowing them to show who they influenced, which I like is the competition aspect of it. And that might be something just to think about if you are going to be launching your own platform. My, my recommendation is that go with this not try to build something. And on that note, Crop Valley, which originated from the UK and Finland with operations in Hong Kong, is now based in New York with offices in San Francisco. A lot of foreign crowdfunding companies have moved to the US because in the US we're more used to using credit cards and we have higher rate of donation per capita than the rest of the world. And it's really difficult to try to convince a society who doesn't use the internet nor use payment systems on the internet to get involved with crowdfunding. So some of the things that we've advised a lot of groups is go after your diaspora, go after the Saudis that live in the US if somebody's going to do a Saudi solution of this. Now Crowd Valley allows you to do crowdfunding without having to build it. They're focused on about 650 asset managers that actually log into their system, pay a few hundred dollars per month, and you have your own crowdfunding site instantly. And the asset managers and wealth managers like this because when they want to show a deal, if they instead of visiting their clients one by one, they can upload the data room and the deal flow on the site and allow their customers or wealth clients to look at a deal more efficiently. So it's, it's a very unique way of getting going without having to spend a lot of money to figure out how things are done. I usually suggest that you get going with something like this and later on decide what makes more sense for you. Now, the 12, this was the most successful campaign. This watch was connected to your cell phone and your iPad. And when you're, if you were watch, washing your hands or doing something with your hands and somebody called you or an email was sent, you would see the message on this watch. In 30 days, they sold $10 million of this. On May 9th, 2012, Eric, one of the five founders, came into one of my presentations in Palo Alto and said, we're winding down the campaign. We couldn't raise $100,000 from angel investors. And we just drowned in deals flow from crowdfunding. It was the record of last year. And another part of the story is that even though they couldn't deliver in six months as they expected, and they started delivering nine to ten months, Charles River Ventures, a venture capital firm in San Francisco, about eight months ago gave them another $50 million to expand. So almost a year later, they got more money to expand their business and it's a great success story how crowdfunding that failed when we were trying to get business angels even got them venture capital. And also you'll see it's a very sleek and elegant product. What most people forget about crowdfunding, it is a commitment and you still have to do heavy advertising. If you do not have a following or a crowd that listens to you, putting something up is not going to do it. You need to have a heavy marketing campaign 
and a strategy to reach people quickly. And we can go on into more details in a different presentation on how do you do a successful crowdfunding campaign, which will be another course in the future. But one thing is you need to find bloggers that are relevant to your topic and time them up so they actually work in conjunction with you. Um, initially, when I worked with the Washington Ballet, a year uh, I gave them some advice and the person didn't listen. Unfortunately, they weren't able to raise as much money as they wanted. I wrote an article, placed it in the right magazine, and within four hours, an additional doubling of the 4,000 they raised up to 8,000 was the amount that we had actually managed to help them with, just for a simple article, which I didn't expect, and it wasn't a lot of money, but it was interesting to see that one article that I wrote would actually turn into cash instantly. Now, today we write for 150 publications on a regular basis, so we actually have a way of highlighting groups that we work with on a global basis. Also, well, the Center of a Center now in people for partnerships on a global basis. This is another company that raised 8.5 million last year. It's an open source gaming console. And uh, very impressive. You know, this is the second runner up last year. Now both of them are products. Well, I'd say out of the $20 million campaigns last year, at least six, 15 or 16 were games. Games are very clever for this. A, if you have played somebody's game, you know the developer and the quality. And you're used to paying for a game online with a credit card. So if a new developer is making a new game, this industry has grown the fastest. First interesting real estate transaction I liked. Um, Tesla's museum and Tesla invented alternate current and was uh, Edison's nemesis, or rather reverse. Edison couldn't stand Tesla because Tesla had worked for Edison, and uh, Tesla was a um, university student who had actually reviewed problems in his head while Edison would actually trial and error every experiment he had and hadn't gone to university. <laughs> And alternate current was the uh, current that won a Niagara Fall competition of being able to bring uh, electricity to Buffalo, while direct current that Edison had couldn't travel long distance. So Edison couldn't stand Tesla, while Tesla got the support of J.P. Morgan to build uh, a lab in Long Island. Now the lab was up for sale and to, to turn into residential con condominiums and be torn down. So a magazine called the Oak, uh, uh, the Oak, I forgot the name of it, Oak, I'll remember it later, I put an article in and said, look, we need to save the museum of Tesla. It can't be turned, uh, turned down. Within seven days, $1.3 million was raised. And they actually had a meeting at the New Yorker Hotel because Tesla died in the New Yorker Hotel in 1956 in room, I'm sorry, 1947, I believe, in room uh, 3327. So they had a uh, press release there about six months ago announcing that they bought the building and they were going to build it into a museum. What was interesting with this campaign too is I used this great example of how real estate was bought through something emotional, but also uh, Tesla loved the number three. He found number three being a magic number and obviously some of the reward from this campaign was $33,333. Only three people had paid that amount of money as a donation. And as I presented in Istanbul for the European Business Angel Network in January, um, the Business Angel of the Year, Dusan Stokanovic, who was presenting five minutes before me, walked up and said, my mother is a relative of Tesla, and I was one of the three people who gave $33,000 as a donation without getting any reward or anything back for it because I wanted the memory of my relatives to live. So it was coincidence that I would actually have this on my own presentation five minutes later and get to meet one of the donors. Dusan and I have been working very closely together and I actually just went to see Tesla's hometown, Smiljan in Croatia a month ago as we are planning to do some celebration of his birthday next year. And now here we go. Oh, I'm also going the wrong way. Uh, 
some of the most successful campaigns today, uh, well, actually the most successful one has been Star Citizen. As I said before, gaming has done extremely well in this industry, actually done better than any other industry across the board. Um, this campaign may raised about uh, two million on Kickstarter. Then they took it off Kickstarter and continued raising money on their own website. As you see, they've raised over $31 million for the last year and a half for this game that's not finished yet. An extreme case of crowdfunding that is just mind-boggling. It should be, you know, showing people, yes, you can do some serious business. And I'll tell you what, real estate is something that we are ourselves reviewing on a global basis as we've been working with um, sovereign wealth funds both in Europe and in the Middle East in the real estate sector. So these numbers are now happening in the real estate side, yet again a lot of people don't know about that. But that's something that everybody here can reach out to me afterwards. Do note down my email uh, if you want to talk to me. Here's one of them. This company raised $20 million from 3,500 3, investors in Colombia using crowdfunding. And in this case, of course, the crowdfunding might be accredited crowdfunding, which means you have to be rich enough to be solicited in the first place to put money in. As I said before, the ideal is to take money from anybody. Some stats from Kickstarter last year. They raised $274 million from 86 million unique visitors. There's 2.2 million people who donated money. And then this is uh, from um, over 177 countries. Pretty impressive numbers from one count company alone. And if they're going to grow two and a half times uh, revenue like they did from 2011 to 2012, they're going to hit you know close to seven, eight hundred million dollars this year. So we'll have to see what they put up this year at the end of the year. We're heavily involved with that finding of crowdfunding. So if there are somebody here who's looking for data on crowdfunding, do reach out to me afterwards. My email is going to be uh, on the bottom. Here's where people put money in in 2012. And note, Kickstarter is the only one who disclosed numbers. Everybody else has kept these numbers quiet. There's about 2,000 crowdfunding websites today out there. But as you see, gaming here was $83 million. That's 35% of the whole lot of money that was put in. Interestingly enough, design and film and video were second runner-ups, doing over $50 million each. This can also be found on the Solar Loft website, so you can get this to look at later on as well. That's $606 per minute by Kickstarter, and they did 17 projects over $1 million in 2012. The, this should be doubling this year, in 2013. So this thing is really taking a position of raising big amount of money, not to be ignored, and it's not being ignored. Now the Jobs Act, the equity side, um, has not passed yet. We started lobbying two years ago about for it. We had events, went to the SEC, and we've been working with the SEC on a daily basis. I was part of founding funding the uh, associations in the U.S. to actually work with the SEC to create these laws, and. Should crowdfunding for equity become legalized in the U.S., which it will be, um, it will probably take another six to eight months. This is a process in place, and that's something I wrote for Thomson Reuters a year ago, that these things will take time, and there's a process there between six to nine months from the point of having a proposal. The proposal was given about two months ago, but the proposal really had mm, 295 questions and 585 pages which to me means after the public hear, uh, the commenting for three months, there might be another proposal going over it for another three months, which could push this almost 2015. Of course, a lot of firms in the U.S., and we, we work with them all, you know, get a little frustrated because the investors are expecting this to have been passed last January. The deadline was January 1st. It's a year later, and we're still not going to see this ready for another six to eight months at the earliest. But the rules were saying that if you earn less than $100,000 a year, you can only invest 5% or 2000 whichever is higher. And over $100,000, you'll be able to invest 
and there were some more restrictions, and we're working through those things on a daily basis with SEC today. This was taken by Seed uh, Invest, one of the leading crowdfunding platforms for equity in North America. Certainly top three, and I put him in Forbes. He yeah, actually wrote down, here are the expenses. This is what you can expect to pay. And he's letting the yellow areas to be, uh, no, the blue areas to potentially be uh, uh, changed. So you can actually play around with the numbers yourself to see how much you can actually raise and how much it's going to cost you. So it's good to understand and get a breakdown of what the law in the U.S. might be able to do. Of course, it's preliminary now to look at this because nobody knows how low these costs can be, but certain things can be very expensive. And this is what we, I've been writing about for two years, that if any of these things are too expensive, this law becomes useless. The whole intention of the Jobs Act, Jumpstart Out of Business Startups Act, was to create jobs. And honestly, the first four pieces of the Jobs Act did not create jobs. And they had to do with uh, IPOs, they had to do with how many investors you could have, this Regulation A, uh, that's also for another class to discuss what these other exemptions on the SEC in the U.S. can and cannot do, and how people in the U.S. can take advantage of this. Angel investors. Now, how are they getting involved and how they're intersecting with crowdfunding, which is pretty interesting. Uh, They've been putting in about average seventy-four thousand dollars, and two of the groups that we covered in the UK, Syndicate Room and Angels, then have done something interesting. And they're using crowdfunding with lead investors from Angels. Angels then claims to be the biggest angel network in the world with sixty-three hundred angels. And Syndicate Room takes a lead investor that's an angel, putting at least fifty thousand pounds into the deal, and then they go and find crowd crowdfund investors to follow the lead on the investment, which I think is a very clever way of doing it. I've been telling Angel Networks for the last two years to embrace this and become the lead and let angel, uh, do, uh, crowd funders co-invest with them because if everybody is making their own due diligence, it becomes a mess and the logistics is just too large. However, if you have a lead investor, then it's a lot faster and people can just take the same terms if it's a well-known business angel. So running a little short on time, I'm going to try to wrap up soon, well maybe not that short of time. Now what's happening on venture capital firms and what's happening there for accredited uh, crowdfunding? Well venture capital firms like our crowd and the funding uh, club are some companies we're going to cover. They've been bought, bought invested an average of six million in the U.S. It's a lot less in Europe, of course. Uh, you know, uh, the private equity deals, the venture capital deals in in Europe are the equivalent of our seed investment deals in the U.S. Since you know, a big portion of you know venture capital, actually more than fifty percent of venture capital globally, is coming from the U.S. So Funders Club has raised $10 million at 55 firms. They're part of Y Combinator graduates and Accelerator. That's probably one of the leading ones in the world. And Funders Club only does online venture capital structures as leads with crowdfunding accredited investors. So what they're doing is saying we're a venture capital firm. We're only investing in Y Combinator graduate companies. And we're taking money from people who are accredited in the U.S. Accredited means you had $200,000 in salary the last two years, expecting to have it again. $300,000 if you're a married couple, or you have a net worth of a million dollars, excluding your home. Our crowd has been doing the same thing, but a little different. They only do firms out of Israel, and they've done a lot in nine months. That's $22 million. That's a structure to watch. And uh, they raise money from the U.S. and Israel, but they act as VC. They take the money from limited investors and they co-invest with other venture capital firms. So General Electric just signed up doing business with them. Seed Invest is a US-based company in New York. They raised $3 million just the last nine months for four, five firms. And then that's a company to look out for because they're actually uh, applying both what the venture capital list firms above are doing, but also what the angel then and syndicate room is doing from the previous page. And these two areas we can go deep on a completely different seminar for another time. 
where we can actually focus in on either one of these. And to do so, of course, I need to add some deep that the people listening to actually get back to Ali and request that so we can do it again. Um, some friends this year, uh, Angel Networks we talked about, University Alumni, and there's about maybe 20 universities who are using the technology now to engage their alumni. I mean, you have a relationship with the alumni. Why not give them the technology online to communicate with them easier and faster? Transfer offices are looking at it. There's classrooms and courses popping up all over the world today about on these topics. Innovation centers, diaspora is great for that. The World Bank just did a report on how technology like this can be used for capturing money coming back to countries in developing, uh, developing countries. Broker dealers are embracing it because the Jobs Act are allowing platforms like Kickstarter or others to go into this space, but broker dealers can do it because they're already registered with SEC. So they're now looking at it and calling us for advice, how to do it on a global basis and a localized basis, and how to go about it and how to streamline the process. So we're talking to five different broker dealers they want to do this globally. Some in Europe, some in the Middle East, and most of them in the U.S. Asset and fund managers, we talked about Crowd Valley, how they like the fact that they can put their deal room up online inexpensively. And there are several groups from Switzerland, France, all over Europe, as well in the U.S., that are doing and are leading at different areas of these spaces. And the World Bank and non-for-profits and non-governmental agencies are now covering it. The report's coming out. The World Bank report came out recently, a month ago, and it's about 45 or maybe more countries in the world looking for crowdfunding for equity. Um, let me see. I'm going to attempt to this. We work with about 35 different universities all over the world, presenting and done it on a regular basis, and we continue to do so. Cornell and Harvard, which just recently, Columbia, we do it regularly. It's a pleasure being here to talk about it. We also talk about how social economics, social nomics, or social media is important because, as I said, if you don't have a crowd listening to you, then nobody will be pre purchasing your product. Putting it up does not make you money. There has to be thought through strategies, and that's why we're seeing in the U.S. a lot of PR firms and marketing firms becoming uh, advisors and consultants for crowdfunding. Uh, uh, races, helping them to do more marketing. And a lot of these groups are saying, look, if you don't have it in a relationship with the crowd, find one. Cross-pollinate between two different industries. Here's my contact information. Um, these are the ways you can reach us and follow us if you have questions or you have ideas or you're working with organizations in your region. Um, please reach out to me directly. The media kit can be downloaded from this page too. So Ali, thank you for having me. Um, we'd love to get a chance to come to Saudi one day to go through certain of these sectors even deeper and in more detail. It's just that it's a very new uh, development in these areas. So I am obviously following it full time on a daily basis. As a media company, we're writing about things that we find interesting. Of course, I write because I'm passionate about this. I do not get paid to write, unfortunately, and fortunately. So I get to write what I think is important. And because we have covered um, business, both from fund of funds down to friends and family and crowdfunding and venture capital, I get to see structures, understand how structures are done in different countries and how they should be done and what it really means. So if anybody asks you what crowdfunding is, you should try to figure out, is it reward, debt, equity, donation? And the fifth area called royalty that we didn't talk about is really revenue share of profit sharing. But we can go in on that if should we do this presentation again. Ali, are you there with me? Uh, yes, uh, David, thank you very much uh, for a very intriguing presentation. And uh, folks, uh, first of all, our apologies for a little technical hitch on the audio side that we experienced in the beginning, but I'm glad it uh, worked fine and uh, David went uh, pretty smooth overall till this end. Now we're open for the question and answers. You could raise your hand. I'll give you an opportunity to speak to David or you could put your questions in the question box. I do see some excitement already because there are a couple of hands already raised and questions being posted in the question box. Let me first move to the first caller. We have 
Dr. Arfan Smile. Dr. Arfan, can you hear me? Could you please introduce yourself uh, from where you're calling and ask the question, please? Hello, Dr. Arfan, can you hear us? Uh, you raise your hand, Dr. Arfan, so let me see. I will move to another caller. Uh, we have Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad Rashad, can you hear us? Could you please introduce yourself and ask? Hey, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for uh, such a wonderful presentation, and it's a uh, uh, eye opener for me, especially. I'm a assistant professor at the College of Business Administration in one of the universities in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and. Uh, 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 my uh, one comment is that uh, I suppose that the voice of investor uh, is very important, especially when you have so much uh, blog orientation and uh, social media playing a very vital role for especially campaign raising funds. And um, uh, I just have a quick question about uh, for the university curriculum, what kind of like, uh, uh, what is the course type of the program where you have this uh, crowdfunding uh, orientation program for the students uh, so is it uh, what is a course I mean to say what's a course for that we have not affiliated ourselves with a university for a course I'm talking to NYU and of course I want to talk to Mile about a course on this topic but we have not uh, officially uh, shared the program that we have put together Right. And as such, you know, uh, one of the reasons I'm here is because Mile um, has convinced me that, you know, it is possible to potentially do this course for Mile. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also wanted to add that crowdfunding is not a holy grail solu solution for everything. They're making right. slides or raising money, but to me, crowdfunding is a tool like Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it's not something you do just once. You do it as a strategy for your social media. Period. So if you have a Facebook page for your company, you should have a permanent crowdfunding solution because you're really communicating with people who care about your business. Right. Yeah, because I, I suppose the budding entrepreneurs, especially the, the, the students in my university who will be in the future with the entrepreneurs, they, they should be well equipped with the, the social media with crowdfunding. Uh, so that they have a high skill scalability in Asia and like in Europe or US, some something like that. So a hands-on uh, kind of uh, uh, aptitude and attitude if they have for that. Uh, as a professor, I'm socially I'm responsible for them to update them. So um, I appreciate if I can get some resources on that so that I can tell my university we can have some kind of course like that. Now, the book called The New Capital Formation will cover crowdfunding for all these different industries right. and look at how the technology of using a, a website, talking to your limited partners in a fund or your right. limited partners in a venture capital organization or a family office or investor for a business angel network is being used. It's also known as crowdfunding, but it's really technology where you log in, you see something, and you click on it. Instead of having fifty, instead of having two lawyers costing you fifty thousand dollars in legal fees, mm -hmm. this is streamlining the process of having capital flowing. Right. And that's how I look at it. And that's the book coming out in three months will cover those things all the way from real estate to pension funds, all the way down to friends and family. And oh, that's that would be, be great then. That will be the basis for the courses that we're developing. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Well, thank you very much, thank Dr. You, Dr. Muhammad, for your no, question. No, no. Uh, let me move back. I believe Dr. Arfan is saying that he got disconnected, so let me try to see if he can speak now. Dr. Arfan, assalamu alaikum. Sir, can you hear us? Could you please introduce yourself and where you're calling from and ask the question? Waik well, Sam. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ali. Uh, my name is Dr. Arfan Ismail. Uh, by um, vocation, I'm uh, head of education services with the press at Oxford University. Um, I am also the founder of a tech startup called uh, OK Do It, um, which is uh, a productivity slash email um, solution. Uh, we were uh, invited as one of 100 um, startups to Web Summit in Ireland, uh, where we uh, pitched um, uh, uh, in front of uh, various VCs and uh, had various discussions, including with Cisco. Um, hi, David. Hi. Pleasure meeting you, Professor Farshmeet. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my question, David, is this, is that basically we've been running OK Do It for two years. Um, we have a, uh, we are kind of a, a group of um, uh, individuals. I'm CEO, um, Tim Abbott is from uh, the States. Uh, we have uh, other founders from Ireland, uh, from, from, from the States, uh, and from one from Bangladesh. The development team is, is in Bangladesh. And we've been funding this, uh, I mean, we've basically been bootstrapping um, for the last two years, and we're, we're, we're funding entirely from, from ourselves. And we're kind of in the stage where we really need to take it to the next level, and we could do some serious seed funding. Um, so we're considering crowd crowdfunding. Um, the problem is, is that we're, we're, we're primarily based in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, we have various different vocations, uh, IT, medicine, I, I myself in education. Um, and uh, we're looking to um, to do some uh, crowdfunding in, in the U.S. I have two questions. The first is that we are incorporated as a company in Hong Kong, um, and that, that's for the tax purposes. And do you think that that being Hong Kong incorporated um, entity will affect um, our ability to crowdfund? And then two, I suppose, it's just a general it's kind of general statement. Perhaps it's too general to be answered. In terms, um, how would you recommend that we go about it? Um, or the most effective way for us to, to crowdfund, to crowdsource? Um, look, we're, I'm talking to different program uh, professors all over the world to create programs uh, that not only educates you know, the students on crowdfunding, but actually have them do it. You know, um, you know, our New York office, we see so many incredible projects that don't have the capacity of running crowdfunding. Because we see the deal flow all the time. We do 300 investor events a year, so we get inundated with hundreds of deals. I'm a, you know, I founded uh, the Puerto Rican Business Angel Network, and I'm on the board for two others. So you know, we heavily involved with business angels, and we do literally 30 of those business angels investor events in North America a year, which are heavily focused on having had just about every VC and business angel network attend in the past. Uh, personally, I was just in Ireland speaking at, uh, at the Culture Tech event a couple of months ago, and I must say the place, Ireland is gorgeous. I, I, I didn't realize that they get paid not to grow anything, and that's why everything is green, because they get paid if they cut the grass and keep grass on the land, <laughs> which is amazing. Uh, now, as far as also you being involved with Oxford Press, and I'm giving this to everybody else listening here. Um, we are looking to put our RSS feed for all the new articles on capital formation as in many places as possible. And if somebody has blogs or access to publications, we'd love to see some of the articles that I wrote for Forbes, and some of the articles I wrote for Thomson Reuters, which is pension fund focused, or um, some of the other 150 publications and articles we wrote would have a fit. Then I would ask everybody to reach out to me because we'd like to be able to, you know, get our message out and educate more people by showing them what's happening. You know, for instance, you know, I was just, well, let me go to your questions, Professor. So your firm is in Hong Kong is incorporated. It's, it's very simple. Um, this is what we've done with advising firms all over the world. Let the Hong Kong company remain and it will just license exclusively the rights of this technology to wherever the investors are. So if the investors ends up being in the UK, then the Hong Kong will license an exclusive agreement of the IP or the technology to the UK. If they're in France, in France, if they're in the US, in the US, you'll go with what the investors want. That's probably the easiest way to do it. For instance, if you want to list with angel list, you have to be a US corporation. And to do so, you most likely will do so on Delaware uh, and register in Delaware. And then you can list an angel list, which means you get access to, you know, 10 to 20,000 angels looking at your deal. That's probably be an easy way to do. Uh, same thing with Seed Invest. You can also go with a syndicate room, but syndicate room in the UK has only done one deal. So, you know, they're going to be inundated with deals and they can't really spend the quality they need on you. Um, you know, an, uh, Angelston that I mentioned before have 6,300 uh, angels globally that work with them. That means they have 400 angels every day logging in, looking at deals. Is that good or bad? Well, you know what? They look at 140 deals a day, and they pick one. So, you know, it's personal relationships, and it's getting in front of people. Old entrepreneurs that raise money successfully, 
they have kissed 200 ugly frogs before they find the money. It's normally not easy. You have to talk to 200 different investors before you find the ones that can give you the money. Some people are extremely fortunate. So there is no holy grail, but there are means and strategies and tools available. And the ones I mentioned should be done at the same time in parallel with crowdfunding, whether or not you do crowdfunding. Um, you know, so there are strategies there, and hopefully I answered most of the questions for you. Well, let me see. Yeah, that was the first question. Yeah, I think so. Is that did I answer your question, Professor? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. I think the second question is really more of a general question, which was, um, I mean, we, we're, we're looking to, to, to crowdsource, um, and uh, we, we have, I mean, there are other people who are more experienced in the, um, in, in the team than I am in terms of this. But just in, in looking at it, at it generally in terms of where it begins, so we were looking at Indiegogo, we established a profile on there. Um, do you think it would be, um, like, just kind of going back to a point you raised earlier, because one of the investors was talking about fronting money um, in order to um, uh, uh, kind of as, as an initial seed amount, fifty or seventy-five thousand dollars, in order to to kind of have the, the other the kind of other funders and kind of crowdsourcing website follow follow in, in this vein. I mean, is do you think that would be a good thing to do? Absolutely. You know, some some of the companies on the business angel side of things, they want lead investors, seed invest. They need a lead investor. Syndicate room needs a seed investor. Of course, syndicate room says it has to be at least eighty thousand dollars, or they don't want to touch it because they're more focused on the academia of uh, Cambridge behind them. So their investors are from there. But yes, uh, there are platforms where you can use a lead investor to take the lead. So when you launch on um, a platform, that lead investor will show that there's activity. Indiegogo is good because you're pre-selling the service, so you're not really giving equity away. Um, so there's two different strategies. You pre-sell the service and don't give equity. If you have such a service, then you can do that. And if you decide to do that one or the equity part, it comes back to the same thing. You have to have a crowd. People just keep forgetting. If you don't have a crowd, nobody listens. Putting it up on the Indiegogo doesn't do anything. You have, to you have to use your social capital and you have to have marketing strategies. A lot of the you know, PR firms that we have advised and helped in the, future, uh, in the US, you know, they know this and they say, I can't take this account. Why? They have no social capital. They have no re relationships, which means they've got to drop a lot of money to find people's contact information and build a relationship because people will give money when they feel that there is a relationship. Either you have a product that just says, I have to have it, and it's so inexpensive, or you're selling them on investing. So, uh, you know, we can go into more detail, uh, maybe in a different conversation, but these are, you know, these, this is advice for a lot of uh, different people listening to this who might have interest in going towards this. But I like to repeat, crowdfunding should be a tool like Facebook that you actually keep doing it on a regular basis. And it's not a one-time success story. I think it should be a research tool. It should be used as, you know, let me know what kind of product design I need, what kind of service that people want. It allow me to do research on what the taste is. And instead of people just voting, people are putting their money where their mouth is. And that's what I like with this. And I foresee that, you know, next year, more and more of Fortune 1000 companies in the U.S. will start using it more and more for their research departments. They won't replace the research departments, but they will be using this and extract information And because you're really engaging people to be part or engaged with your company and your growth. Over to you. Uh, well, Dr. Arfan, uh, shall we move to another question or you have any supplementary to further ask? No, th thank, thank you very much, David, uh, and Ali as well. So okay, it's dealt thank, with my issues. Thank, you, thank you very much, Dr. Fan, for posing this question. And uh, let me move to a question box now. We have uh, a question from Brother uh, Karam Laban, who is representing the Saudi Telecom. Oh, I'm sorry, he's uh, 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 not, okay, he said he's not from uh, Saudi Telecom. Uh, but the question is, how do you protect your idea when asking for funding on the internet like this? 
Um, uh, there's a couple of ways to protect the idea, and sometimes you don't. And this question has come up many times in the last two or three years that we've been working here. If you heard, if you have trade secrets, then you know you can't disclose the trade secrets and the story. You know. Um, also, you got to remember if we're talking about crowdfunding, it's really consumer focused and not always focused on a B two B or government to government. It has to be a consumer who gets the reward and experience. Um, and, and back to the trade secrets and IP, there are platforms that we work with in the consumer products and the uh, industry where they can protect the IP while using crowd innovation and creation to come to solutions. So there are ways to combine funding with innovation platforms to accomplish the same thing because everybody's working only on a piece of the puzzle. And also when it comes to design of clothing, you can't. So if you sell the design, somebody else can copy it. That's the that's how it is in the land of fashion. Anybody can copy it, and you know, that's a good example. But you know, my advice has been well. Then you brand it. You brand it with somebody else who has a crowd and makes it unique. Such as, I know the, um, I know the person who built the bull on Wall Street, Alfredo. He's an Italian gentleman who actually built the statue and he dropped it off on Wall Street 10 years ago, maybe more, 15. He literally took a truck to Wall Street, looked at the cop going around the corner and dumped the bull in front of uh, Goldman Sachs building and ran off. And of course, they caught him, he got fined and finally agreed to put the bull where it is today. But the point there is you can take a brand like that and say, hey, let me license your logo on my clothing. And now you have a logo copyrighted and protected that's on the clothing and the clothing might be copied on the design but they can't and they're not allowed to copy the logo. So there's ways to do that where you actually combine different resources to make it a little harder for people to enter. And obviously you know uh, there are solutions coming out there where people are dealing with the fact of how you're going to protect your IP. Well I mean the only way to protect your IP is you file it or you don't disclose it. And that's why we have intellectual property laws. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me move to uh, another short question. Uh, why do you think gaming industry is more popular on crowdfunding? Uh, I, I mentioned briefly before, maybe it was a bad connection, but Gamers are used to spend money on the internet through their credit card while playing. They feel very comfortable using a payment mechanism online. And when they've played a game and they know that that developer is making a new game, then they have a history of admiring the quality. And their expectations are usually that the quality will be equally as good or better. Consequently, you have a following that trusts your previous work and will put their money to be the first one to get the game. And then, you know, and also, you know, if you want to be clever on how you do rewards, you just say, well, if you give me hundred dollars, I'll give you the game when it's ready. But if you give me two hundred dollars, I'll give it the game when it's ready, but it's thirty days before anybody else. So, you know, the gamers want to be the first to get a game. And they want to be able to talk about it and follow it. And uh, talk about the game while they're playing games with others. So you have a community that is very open to how the process works. Over to you. Okay. Let's see if there's another question. There's another one. Uh, is there a risk for companies that issue shares through crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, which could ultimately deter venture capitalists or angel investors for investing in a firm that is owned by thousands of in inexperienced shareholders? What about the lawsuits? Right. Correct. And this, this is the topics we've been discussing all over the world for for the last two years as well, and it's been a very good comment. Um, one solution is drag along clause. The venture capitalists have been using that for a long time. If a majority owner or a founder uh, triggers to sell stock or sell the company, it drags along everybody else. And that mechanism is going to have to be implemented by either the platform or the issuer, issuer being the person doing the uh, campaign raising money. And as they educate themselves, more and more are putting that into, and that's something the venture capitalists have been doing for a very long time. 
I was at the Business Angel Association, the Angel Capital Association, last April, which was the largest one they ever had in San Francisco. And I went to, of course, that uh, seminar talking about this. And the business angels are now, just the last year, starting to duplicate and replicate the venture capital process of the drag along clauses and you know triggering uh, these things. Another way to do it would be to implement that, look, if you make a certain amount of money in a certain period of time, we are allowed to drag you along and sell your stock and force you to sell. And the venture capitalist is going to demand that. They're just not going to want to deal with, it's not going to be feasible for them to deal with 30,000 individual investors. So it's not that it's feasible, not at all. It's going to have to be structured in a way that you can actually uh, force them to sell at a reasonable rate or at the same rate as the main investor is. Over to you. We have one last question, a short one from Anna Kerman. What crowdfunding platform should a research and non-profit organization should consider? Uh, repeat the question. What kind of what kind of cross crowdfund platform should a research or non-profit organization should consider? Like an NGO, I believe. I mean, the non-profit. Um. Look, there's 200,000 platforms out there. I, I, I do not know. I would suggest you just go on Google and look at a couple of them. You know, do search the top 10 NGO crowdfunding sites. I'm sure there's some article out there, and if there's not, email me, and I will write it so you'll get your answer. Uh, I like why you're the top 10. Okay. Well, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Um, David, thank you very much for your presentation, and my apologies that in the beginning we had to struggle, but I'm glad it worked out. So any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? Um, I welcome everybody to reach out to me by email, and uh, we enjoy writing, so if you have a story that you think we should write, uh, I'd love to hear it. Um, and I'd like to cover more stories from the Middle East and Saudi Arabia specifically. Um, so yes, do reach out and say, hey, maybe you can interview this company or this opportunity, and we'll gladly consider it. Okay. Thank you very much again, David, and thank you all of those who participated in this webinar and for posting the questions or asking the questions. We are recording this webinar. Uh, a recorded version will be uploaded on Mild Community, which is community.mild.org. Uh, we would request David to also share the soft copy of the presentation so we can make it available for you to download through my community as well. And once again, thank you all. I'm going to end this webinar so you all will be automatically dismissed out. So you all have a good day, good evening.